As you probably know, uh, this is the panel on culture, diversity, and governance. I was the fill-in moderator, I think, after the nine previous moderators were uncomfortable <laughs> moderating the panel, but I'm ha happy to be here. S -s Second choice was a panel on Trump and the NFL, and <laughs> we decided not to do that one. But, but kid kidding aside, um, let me introduce our panelists and then we'll talk about the topic. Um, Dana Grayson from NEA to my left, Susan Lyon from BBG Ventures, Kevin Thau from Spark, and Ken Bennett from Bessemer. So thanks folks for agreeing to talk about what, all kidding aside, is such an important topic. Um, let, let me start with sort of the positive, which is I think we all recognize, and it's pretty broadly understood, that diverse teams result in better outcomes. <laughs> And that is both at the management team and company level and work groups, as well as at the board level. Uh, so, so let's take a quick poll amongst this group in kind of rating yourself. Can you rate first your own firm on a scale of one to five, five being the best, uh, on how well you have done to create a diverse and inclusive environment? Delightful. Um, so. <laughs> well, one, one to five. <laughs> one to five. Uh, I'll give us a three and a half. Dana? I, I would give us a six. Nice, Susan. Wow, um, I was going to say a four for us. We we're only a three-person team, two females, but we did find a um, a male to take our our associate role. Congrats, Kevin. I'm going to go with the three and a half as well. Three and a half. All right, let's do a couple other quick questions to get the ball rolling. Rate your portfolio on the same scale relative to diversity and inclusion. And I know this is hard because that includes lots of companies, but overall. Yeah, and my question about that is, am I rating the way they're approaching diversity or the way we're investing? I'm, no, I, need, I need a lot of if, if you contract take, if language take, here. Take existing companies in your portfolio, on average, what score would you give them? Five's the best, one's the worst. I, yeah, it's a wide range and I think I'm gonna go four. I mean, we've got some that are incredibly impressive and thoughtful and some that are um, you know, in the sort of benign neglect phase still. Got it. Six just, again? Or? I'm laughing at myself because I thought it was on a scale of one to ten. So I'll take that <laughs> score. Let, I think wait, it's terrible. Let, that changes everything. Let, 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 let's changes start over. Let, I know this is not an entrepreneur panel to VC five. panel, so let me keep the questions a little more simple. Uh, <laughs> We're venture capitalists. You have to repeat questions. Uh, so I would take back my previous answer and do a three, uh, <laughs> not a three and a half even. Uh, on, the, on my portfolio, I'd say a four, actually. Great. Susan? Um, well, we only invest in companies that have at least one female founder. So uh, that said, I'd say 40% of our companies have got male and female founders. Um, so our, our portfolio is pretty diverse. Great. Kevin? I'm going to say a four, I think, uh, yeah. So I, I'm going to go off script here for a minute because, Susan, I think that's a really interesting point you made. So let me put you on the spot for a second. Because you invest in only female founding companies, does that mean they all are strong on the diversity and inclusion front? Uh, I think they're stronger than, than startups are typically. Um, once they get beyond the two founders or the three people who start the company together, they tend to have a broader mix. Now, I will say that on gender, um, I'm not going to tell you that they are hugely diverse on other scales. Got it. So let's, um, let, let's jump for a second to kind of the dark side of this topic, um, the terms that have been thrown around and associated with our industry, both the tech entrepreneurial industry and the venture industry this year have been pointed. Sexism, racism, discrimination, harassment have been all over the news. Um, this is a group of important investors and important firms that oversee the allocation of capital in many of these companies. And so I think you guys have a pretty unique perspective on what can be done, what can be done better, and, and, and maybe some things that actually are being done well right now in your experience. So, so let's jump to a little of that. And, and maybe for starters, let's start with the why on this diversity topic. So we all believe intuitively that diverse teams create better outcomes. Um, why is that? 
I mean, so I think there's a, a lot of reasons that may sound obvious to everybody in the crowd, but diverse groups make better decisions. So you get people from all the same background, same perspective, and uh, they tend to not think about things that di more diverse teams can. Uh, diverse leadership teams have a, a easier time recruiting more talent. They just are, are able to draw from a bigger talent pool, uh, which can make a lot of differences as, as you're trying to build big teams. Um, so those are two easy ones. Anything to add? Yeah, I would say networks. You know, di different people from different backgrounds, different educations included, different locations, different ethnic backgrounds, female, male, all know different people and different perspectives come with that. Susan, you want to add anything? I start from the customer. So there's a, there's a quote from a book called uh, Why She Buys. Um, that goes, uh, if the consumer economy had a sex, it would be female. And I think that's, um, that's really core here. You know, women make 70 to 80% of all consumer purchases. So, so having somebody on your team and preferably having more than one person on your team who really knows that end user, who knows how she's going to use this product, when she's gonna use it, what will delight her, um, that's a competitive advantage. So uh, I, I like to start the, uh, the conversation about why diversity matters with the fact that you can serve your consumer base better if you've got people who really understand who's on the other end of this. And do you limit that in others way in to consumer companies? Um, I, I certainly, that's what I focus on, so that's what I think about first, but uh, many, many SaaS companies and, um, and even enterprise companies ultimately have an end user who is either female or male, but there's a whole lot of women who are using these products. Um, so I would say yes. Dana, do you want to weigh in? Well, I was just going to say that in the consumer world, that I think it's not only important to be diverse, but I would, for that reason, almost argue that if you do not have females, you know, represented significantly inside your company, not only are you not diverse, but you're actually not pulling from the right talent pools anymore. Because consumer companies, there's just no excuse. Like, there's tons of talent available. It's very important to your customers. What are you doing wrong if you're not, you know, accurately balanced? Yeah, I think um, an interesting thing we just did uh, recently, we did a workshop on uh, unconscious bias. Um, and we all read the book, uh, Think Fast, Think Slow before. And, and so back to the diversity thing, I think we all have these, uh, you know, these two methods of making snap decisions and we all come with our just built-in bias. And so when you brought in the group to diversity, that, that, that expands. Um, these unconscious bias that we all have, and so by widening that group, you are uh, changing the the just like the baseline of everyone's perspective that they're coming from. Well, well, to reinforce that point, um, Jack Ma, who's obviously been a relatively successful entrepreneur, said, "I quote: the secret sauce of Alibaba Group's success is 48% of employees are women." Now, that's probably not true across all of our portfolios. Um, I've seen it firsthand at Rent the Runway where it's actually higher than 50%, but it's probably atypical. So while we could argue if the customer consumer is a woman, it's sort of plain dumb obvious to have women involved both in the founding team and the leadership team. As you think more broadly about how you maintain not just male-female diversity, but all sorts of diversity in a company, given the reality of the talent pools in the market you're playing in, Anything you've seen work particularly well or people that you think have gone out of their way to do the right job? I mean, I think step one to Kevin's point is you have to have, you know, as I thought about your one to five scale, um, which was, you know, kept me up last night, like, where do we fall? 3.27. Um, but, you know, number one on that scale is like hostile environments, you know, the sort of criminal behavior that's been in the press this year that I think has us up here talking. Um, but what I think we'll spend more more of this conversation talking about is sort of the rest of it, which is the implicit bias. And I think to Kevin's point, like you have to explicitly talk at these companies about these issues. You cannot exist in this realm of benign neglect and assume that we're all nice people and we're going to make good choices. So I think that's 
that's number one, is you just have to have explicit conversations um, in any executive hiring decisions as you're thinking about how to set the culture of your, your organization. If you aren't addressing this topic, then you're, you're ignoring it and you're gonna be victimized. You're gonna sort of screw it so, up. So, so let's double click on that for a second. So is that, is that uh, an appropriate role of a board member, investor in these companies? Yes, I mean, it's, you know, you would hope that the leadership teams of these companies, and they often are bringing this to you before you can even say it, but absolutely. Um, if, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can reinforce it, or if, if you have to be the first one to say it, it's a problem, and you can't think, um, okay, well, gosh, I can't believe I had to bring this one up. It's, it's sort of a serious thing if you're the first one to mention it these days. Any other thoughts on that topic, sort of the role of all of us as investors and board members around this topic with our companies? Sure. I think it, I think managing this, you know, while I appreciate things like unconscious bias training, we've done these things um, as well. These are all sort of fall in the bucket of corporate training and things that we go into a room and then potentially forget when we leave. I think it comes down to just strict, you know, metrics management, the same way you would manage any sort of goal at your companies uh, or your company if you're an entrepreneur. So if you want to achieve your bookings number for the quarter, you measure it by days, by weeks, by months, and by the quarter. If you want to hire women at your company, you need to start with the pipeline. And if you're not interviewing women, which is something we figured out, why we didn't have any women at our firm, because we weren't interviewing them, then you're probably not going to hire them. And so you have to, you know, it's just really diligent metrics management. Susan, why don't you answer, and then I want to ask yeah, a follow-up question. Yeah, I, I was going to also say, I, I think it starts with board members, and um, I, I'm sure all of you are on boards um, that have got no female representation on them. Uh, there's one easy way to, to deal with that. You can bring on an independent board member, um, and there are lots of places you can go to start looking for those women. In fact, the board list was started up specifically for that purpose. There are something like 1,800 women on it with very specific skill sets who have been rated by their peers about whether they'd be good on a board that was a Series A company, a Series B company, C, whatever. Um, but uh, I, I would start there because you're not going to have those conversations on a board if you don't have a board that actually has got a certain amount of, of diversity on it. Um, and the second thing I'd say is that, that I would also be careful about um, sort of ghettoizing women within companies. Uh, and I've, I've worked at many companies over the years. And, uh, and in most of them, um, even the ones that have large numbers of female employees and even female executives, they end up being in marketing, in communications, in finance. Uh, they don't end up running business units and they don't end up having that impact on the consumer that I think we're talking about here. So it's more than just metrics. That's the first piece of it, but I think it's also um, just making people aware of uh, the other ways that, uh, that diversity has to creep into a company. Well, so I, th I think this, this idea of starting at the board level is a great one. And, and my guess is for all the investors in the room, raise your hand if every one of your companies has at least one woman on the board. So we can all do better on that front, right? <laughs> Uh, I didn't see any hands go up. And that's, an e that's an easier solution, in fact. But let's talk about the hard one, which is you're sitting on the board of a company, it's doing well, they're growing quickly, the goal is to hire people to fill seats in important roles to keep growing, and the pool of candidates is smaller if you limit it to women than men. Uh, do you hold off and make sure that you hire the target number of women or minorities of other types that you decided you wanted to hire, or do you hire the best people you can find regardless? What would your advice be? It's a, it's a hard one. I mean, we've talked about the, you know, internally I think a lot of us have had conversations about should the Rooney Rule apply at the top of the funnel where every executive search you have, you're seeing qualified um, female candidates, diverse candidates. Um, you know, I would say yes. I would say that no matter how fast a company is growing, if it is growing so fast that you literally um, can't wait another week to see one 
uh, diverse candidate for a senior role, um, you know, something's wrong. I mean, that, that's, that level of growth is going to destroy the company anyway. Um, and that's probably not a realistic scenario, and it's probably an excuse you're letting yourselves off too easily. Um, you know, I think when it comes down to the hiring decision, you know, my perspective that I'd be curious for the panels is um, doing everything you can to open the top of the funnel, uh, and that means going beyond, I think, a lot of the... Um, uh, the danger for uh, you know male VCs is we use our networks and we talk about the power of our networks, which are going to be highly biased um, groups just naturally. So doing everything we can to expose ourselves to diverse candidates at the top of the funnel, uh, and then explicitly addressing the implicit biases we may bring to those hiring decisions, uh, and then leaving the hiring decisions to the to the teams. Obviously, at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think. But, but to, let me let me just put you on the spot for the second because it's hard to disagree with anything you said. So now you're sitting in a board meeting, and the CEO We've says, I'm going to miss this my, my best friend from oh, Let's make it forever. easier. I'm going to miss my numbers if we hold out for the target number of women or minorities on the team. Or I can make my numbers. And we've got a fundraise. And or we're in a process. What do you say? Yeah, and again, I've never been in a situation where, I've, where we have, from the board level, bottlenecked the ultimate hiring targets. We've set guidance for top of funnel. Um, and so, and so maybe we're not holding ourselves to a tough enough standard, but I, that's never come up to me. And if it did, I would say we're, we need to fill the seats and with the candidates we have, and we need to do what we need to do right now to fix the top of the funnel so that six months from now, this is not the same conversation. Any other thoughts on that topic? Uh, you, you know, I, I think there are always going to be situations where you know the perfect candidate for a job and you think you can recruit him. Um, and you should go for it. I, I mean, honestly, I don't think that 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 one um, uh, one hire makes or breaks this issue. Um, I just think you have to be really careful if that keeps happening over and over again. And one of the ways to get around that is to make sure you're thinking ahead of time and you start building networks of awesome women who you know can do a phenomenal job at X, Y, or Z. And they're out there. Um, I, uh, we usually end up trying to push for a different kind of, of diversity in the companies that we invest in. So we're actually building um, uh, lists of brilliant, great guys. <laughs> uh, but Very I hard think, to find. Hmm? Very hard to find. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think it's, it's very feasible to start creating those kinds of, of databases that, that allow you to have that conversation when the time comes about um, who would be a great CMO to bring in here or can we get someone who really understands growth hacking or XYZ. Yeah, fundamentally, it's got to become a, to get yourself out of this reactionary situation that you described. I mean, it's got to be like a fundamental belief that diversity across teams makes, is a strategic advantage for the company. Then you would like craft the, the right, you know, the org will craft itself in that um, mold because you believe that it is a strategic advantage versus reactionary, it's the end of the quarter, you but, know what I mean? But, and I totally agree with it intellectually, but yeah. candidly, just like hearing the comments and thinking about my own behavior in that situation, the, the, when companies are growing fast, no matter how forward they thinking they are about that topic, they don't feel like they have time to do it right. It is slower companies that aren't growing fast that tend to have the time to get it right from the top down and take time to make decisions. And I think we somewhat correctly drive that behavior because we're driving for growth and success. And so I don't know what the, what the happy medium is between the two, but. Yeah, there are, three, there are three sort of lessons as a CEO that you always have to be thinking about. You know, always be fundraising, always be selling, and always be hiring. And so, you know, the pendulum will sometimes swing to heavy growth or high growth. Hopefully it, it stays there. And you suddenly have to hire, you know, in a different way, and you're, you're going to overhire men, or you're going to overhire in white men, or you're going to overhire some other, you know, engineers versus product, or engineers versus marketing. But in the same way that if you're not always fundraising, when the time comes, it will catch up with you, and you will not have 
the best investors or the best options even at your disposal, or if you're not always selling, you're going to get behind on the quarter. If you're not always hiring, and that means interviewing people every day at the early stages as a CEO, or even at the mid stages, you know, there's a tipping point at some point when the CEO is not interviewing everybody, and when the CEO is not interviewing somebody every day. It's actually surprisingly late in a company's growth, but if you're not if you're not building that and you're not actively always hiring, your culture will catch up with you because you're not hiring in the right way. It, it, it is interesting. I mean, I, I think it's hard to argue that it doesn't start at the top. And so the folks in this room actually can have a huge influence over this answer because, it, of course, if you're an entrepreneur starting a company, but I think also if you are an early stage investor, if you're on the board of a seed stage or A round company, that's the point where you're probably filling out the senior management team. And that is the point where you probably have some time, right? Because those searches always take time. And you could make the hard decisions to wait a little bit longer and make sure that the senior team has a broader reflection of humankind on it than just a bunch of guys in New York. Um, if you did that, do you think that would filter down into the hiring decisions that ultimately characterize the company? Sure. You have to, you have to set your culture you know, the way you want the company to be shaped in many ways. Is it fun? Is it serious? Is it, there's many vectors of culture, diversity being one of them. And I think if you set that tone and set that culture and set that example at the senior levels and at the board level as a CEO who has influence over the board, you know, the structure too, uh, it, will, it will trickle down. It doesn't mean that you can just do that and then let it go. Uh, you know, I think you do have to watch the funnel, or watch the metrics um, on who you're interviewing. We found, you know, at NEA that uh, when we didn't have female associates in the pool of our candidates, we didn't hire them. But when we did, uh, and to a significant balance, we ended up hiring sometimes in, in one year, like more female associates than we did men. So it's about finding the qualified candidates are out there. So you, if you're not finding them, then you have to ask yourself, again, especially in the consumer space, but everywhere, why not? Any other thoughts on that topic, guys? Kevin, well, and Kevin? I just will emphasize that it's culture, so it, you can have you know, the right execs at the right moment and think that you've got the problem fixed, but if, if it's not written down on the wall, um, then it's really hard for it to double and double and double again and stay in the same proportion. So, so culture is the place, you know, the company values is where you can etch it in stone. And a lot of these companies' early days, you know, we've seen, I've seen many times where it's like engineering dominated, male culture, early days, they're growing really fast, and you ask them to write down their values, and they, you know, think that's silly. I mean, less so today than maybe five years ago. Um, but that's the piece of the early company building that scales better than anything else if you get it right. So, so that raises a really interesting point about culture we should talk about. Um, Josh Koppelman, I was sitting on a panel with a couple of years ago in a, in a panel about brand building. And he said something really interesting, which was you can't just sprinkle on brand later in the company's life. Like, it has to be there from the very beginning. And I think you could argue culture is very much the same thing. It is fundamentally a function of the founding team and sort of what they're all about. So if that's true, if everyone agrees with that, and that is ultimately going to influence the type of people they hire and how they hire them, then how does that influence who you pick and who you're willing to work with? You being investor, picking entrepreneurs. Kevin? I mean, I completely agree that companies' DNA gets set really, really early. Um, and I think looking, understanding that, and it is hard to change, um, should affect the way you look at early teams and the composition of those early teams. I really like the idea of the board. Um, I think that gets, a, not enough people say that. I think that's a really good point that, because um, that also gets created early and that can be a part uh, of the ingredients that affects the culture. So I think um, starting there, founding teams, initial hires, you know, it kind of goes in that, that sequence, right? And uh, yeah, I, I do think you're not going to fix it later, right? Like trying to unwind later is not the, the answer. So starting at the very, very beginning has got to be the way. Yeah, and I think we've all read enough stories about Uber over the summer um, as almost the poster child for this issue. Uh, and it's complicated, right? Because um, this was a company that was growing so fast and 
was uh, was doing so in part because they were rule breakers and they weren't taking no for an answer, uh, and we all celebrated them. And I I am a I, you know I don't know what I would do without Uber, to be honest. So it's a it's not a simple issue, um, but I think it is. We should all, at this point, having read enough, and maybe there are Uber investors in this room, um, uh, understand that, that at some point, it's gonna come back to haunt you. Uh, and so dealing with, um, with the, the toxic elements of a culture sooner rather than later is probably critically important. Dana, anything else on that topic? Um, I, except for, you know, always be hiring. That is your main mechanism of controlling culture. But I would also say with that, you are, as the CEO, the main steward of your culture. And ideally, as you grow, you hire other execs who are stewards of their culture and really get it. Um, you know, actually, a senior exec at Uber gave me this advice and that there's two ways to really control culture or to influence culture and to be a steward of that culture. And it's very simple, actually, especially if you're at the top. And that's, it's, it's all influenced and affected by what you as a senior leader permit and what you celebrate. So if your culture is set in a certain way and someone in the company sends an email, um, you know, listing some accomplishment or something that has happened, if that's like right in line with the culture, you celebrate that email, you tell everyone how wonderful this is, and, and by the same token, if you're in a meeting and someone makes a derogatory remark about some race or ethnicity or, or um, gender, and you kind of let it slide and ignore it, then that also affects the culture. That's a good point. That's a good way to think about it. So, you know, if you believe in the, boy, we can affect this from the top down, uh, adding more women and more minorities and more diversity to boards is one way to do it. Um, easy to argue that more female investors are more likely to find more great female entrepreneurs, and then the problem starts taking care of itself in a very positive way. And the no longer unspoken reality of our industry is that I think, you know, if, if we had 10 people on this panel and we were representative of the industry, only one of us would be a woman. Actually, a little less than one of us, um, which is hard to do. Uh, and so that's a real issue. Any thoughts on how we overcome that? And anything you're doing in your firms that are kind of making a step in the right direction? I'm. Uh I will start here, you know, uh, I, I used to hear, when we were starting BBG Ventures, I used to hear, you know, I, I don't know, there, there just aren't that many women who are starting companies or starting tech companies or tech-enabled companies, and I'm, I'd be concerned about deal flow. Um, and we saw 1,800 companies with a female founder in the first three years of operating. So there are plenty of women who are starting companies. I think what we need to see is um, some big exits, and I think there will be those in the next year or so. We know about a couple of them, um, and once that starts happening, I think it's going to start a, a chain reaction of more VCs being interested in, in investing in female founders, understanding that there are certain kinds of companies and certain business models they're going to understand that other founders are not, right? Stitch Fix as a concept would not have been imagined by someone other than a woman. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that ecosystem, those 1,800 companies we've seen, are going to start kicking off people who, you know, at some point leave um, uh, or who, who are part of a company with an exit. Um, and you will begin to have the same thing we've seen in, in Silicon Valley and, and even here, where you get second and third generation founders who are... Um, are really experienced and who can do this really, really well. So part of this is just a little bit of time, um, but I think it, it also demands um, uh, getting in now and really developing relationships with these women so that, uh, that 
you have a shot at what are going to be some incredible companies going forward. And I guess related, it w maybe you guys can comment on just the efforts inside your own firms, if you're comfortable with it, relative to more female investors to kind of get at this issue that Susan's describing. Yeah, I think, um, so our model is um, sort of a matched up apprenticeship model where the partners work with uh, analysts and junior associates. And, and so I started as an associate nine years ago and you know, after six years was promoted to partner. So our cycle takes a little time. Um, we've been having this conversation internally explicitly for many years, uh, many more years than this was in the press and it's, and it's taken some time and we now have a, a pipeline of um, some one uh, one female partner recently promoted junior talent, um, uh, you know, some incredibly talented uh, junior uh, female um, associates and principals. But it does take time, and it's uh, it all started with you know being very explicit about who who the applicant pool is for our analyst position, our associate positions, um, and uh, it's a lot. It's it's very easy at that level to widen those pools. Um, to proactively go out and seek out people who may not have been, you know, inbound or part of somebody's near network. Um, but then it takes years to sort of filter through in our model, um, which is a little frustrating for some of us, but... Nature of the business, though. Dana, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's something we struggle with all the time because we have a, a similar model, not necessarily an apprenticeship, but we're better at uh, promoting from within. So we did, you know, do the math and say, well, if we're not hiring at the junior level, you know, a significant female to male ratio, um, then it's gonna take us even longer, <laughs> like decades. So uh, that's something we've made a very large concerted effort around. Something else we've done in light of the um, things that have happened this summer uh, with other venture capitalists in the industry is we've changed our sexual harassment policy. This has nothing to do with, you know, affecting the internal um, inner workings of our firm and male and female, but externally, you know, our, our, our sexual harassment policy is what the EEOC or whatever, you know, creates and everybody has one. Uh, internally, it covers your employees, but we've uh, expanded it to include anyone that we do business with, uh, which I think is something else that is part of. So, so that's sort of explicitly in a term sheet or in the docs that a company No, it's just our policy, policy that we, we're figuring out now, like where that belongs and how interesting. we tell people about it. It's a good way to set the example. Kevin? Yeah, we don't hire a lot of uh, associates, so we don't have that. We have a different model, um, but we're not a big firm, so we have a limited number of partners. But, um, I mean, we're very aware of it. I mean, our most recent, uh, the latest general partner to join the firm was a woman, Megan Quinn. Um, so, you know, we're trying, we, you know, you have, there's different challenges, right? So if, if uh, you have a small partnership, only so many general partners, you're only going to add so many new. If you're associates, it's in a different funnel um, and takes time, but it's just good that everyone's talking about it and aware of it and trying in their own models to, to fix it. Uh, let, let me go back to something, Susan, you were just commenting on. Um, it's a topic that I've personally conflicted on what the right answer is. And that's this, you know, plethora of female entrepreneurs starting companies and what the implications of that are for us as venture investors. And so in theory, it should mean that we're backing as many women as men or maybe more women if more women are starting companies. And I guess from my own experience, and I backed a number of women in a number of different companies, um, and we have across our firm, but I, I'm involved with the Rent the Runway Foundation, which you guys may know helps coach and nurture and then fund female entrepreneurs who otherwise wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't have the opportunity to do so. And a lot of what you see are great entrepreneurs with really interesting ideas that are not venture backable ideas. And I've heard the argument, and I think the data supports it, that if you looked across the base of women starting businesses, many of those are great businesses, but not venture backable businesses per se. And so should we penalize ourselves for backing fewer women as venture capitalists uh, if the businesses they're building don't meet the spec? And I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think that there are a certain number of those businesses that genuinely are not, are not venture backable and never would be. But the other thing I see over and over again is that, um, that 
women pitch businesses, men pitch unicorns. You know, women pitch the business they're building right now and what they know they can build. Um, and you have to teach them that they have to step back from that and talk about what it is that this could be in success. And it's not natural, right? It, it, it doesn't come to them the same way that it does to guys. And I've taken pitches, hundreds and thousands of, of pitches over the years from both men and women. Um, and, you know, I have rarely seen a deck from a guy that doesn't paint a picture of a billion dollar company in the first two or three slides. <laughs> so um, it's, it's actually one of the things we spend a lot of time with our portfolio companies on just to get them ready for their next round and to really think about what it is that they're building. And it's bigger than they think. Other thoughts? I mean, it, I meet a ton of venture, non-venture backable businesses every day of the year. Um, and to, I can't say that more female-led versus male-led, actually. Uh, I, I take our job as you know, venture capitalist is finding those rare entrepreneurs that are one out of 20, one out of 50, one out of 1,000 that can do something unthinkable, which is build a great big business, attract all the right people, fundraise all the time, sell all the time, hire all the time, and uh, be positive and optimistic all the time, too. And those, that's what entrepreneurs are. That's what killer entrepreneurs do. And... Uh, I think it's our job as venture capitalists to go find those diamonds in the rough, and they're not where you expect them to be. They're in university classes, they're uh, in random conferences in Canada you might show up at, you know. They're, you know, we have to go find the contrarian um, points of view out there, and uh, I, I haven't seen any statistics personally in my own life that more men are fem or, or, than female are doing that. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's a game of very, very small numbers when it comes down to the ultimately multi-billion dollar exits. And so it's sort of like uh, I, in my past life I was in Hollywood and people there would just be like, oh, we need more shows like Seinfeld. I was like, no, the Seinfeld is Seinfeld. There's no, this show's not going to be that. And so it allows us to tell ourselves any story we want to tell ourselves about like what will lead to success. But... Um, to the extent that I've seen style differences, and I, I would say, you know, I might agree that I feel like a lot of the female entrepreneurs I deal with are more direct. I love it. I mean, I think there's nothing I hate more than hand-waving around something that's not there yet. And, you know, like Dana said, if our job is to sort of get to the heart of, is there a multi-billion dollar potential business in here, starting with the facts is, you know, is refreshing. Not to overgeneralize, because you see all sorts of flavors, but... Um, and so I think that's, um, we, could, we could probably coach more of our male founders to tone it down. <laughs> like, let's start with what's actually happening today. Um, and uh, so we can, you know, have an authentic conversation to begin with. Well, one thing I'll add to the mix that I think is a potential solution to, to a part of this problem, because I do think there, is a dispro there are a disproportionate number of women starting businesses, often consumer businesses that aren't really venture-backable consumer businesses, and they do it more than guys do in the consumer world. Um, there isn't a good capital source for those women um, because they often aren't high growth, uh, high exit potential type of businesses. They don't meet our spec generally. And until they are five to 10 million in revenue and EBITDA positive, they don't meet traditional growth equity specs. And so there isn't a ton of options for those folks. Um, maybe there needs to be. So any thoughts on how you can make that world work? Don't you think that's kind of changing though? I mean, isn't the, isn't the venture capital set um, waking up more to these consumer brands that are, you know, venture backable? I'm still a little fuzzy on what that exactly means, but, um, is uh, like Glossier is a good example. I mean, would you say a makeup company is a venture back? But well, it's backed by venture capitalists, so yeah. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. And it seems to be going pretty good. Yeah. So um, I think the world is changing. I think like if you and I'm new to this venture capital world, so I, I don't have like the greatest corpus, but it uh, seems to me the world has changed quite a bit from when we only do. I think you could rewind. 
10 years or whatever, we only do software. We only invest in software companies to, we'll do a little hardware, we'll do services, we'll do hardware. Now we're looking at consumer brands. I, don't, I think it's evolving. Um, it seems to be happening just around us. Are there questions from the audience you would like our illustrious panel to opine upon? Uh, do we have a microphone for the audience? Terrific. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for talking about this topic. Um, so I wanted to ask about, so when you talk about diversity, you, um, a, a lot of it's focused around the, the gender diversity aspect of it. Can you talk about some of those topics with um, multicultural diversity in mind? So in terms of hiring, investment philosophies, and how you encompass that, um, as well as gender diversity. I, I think the same rules apply, you know, in terms of metrics and funnel and, um, you know, just, I guess the reason people talk more unfairly or fairly about the female male thing is that seems to be the glaring discrepancy these days. Uh, but in certain companies, uh, other forms, cultural diversity, ethnic, racial, is also an issue for sure. Um, there's no question that, that everything we say about women um, is just multiplied when you talk about racial diversity or any other, um, uh, any other diverse populations. Uh, there's one company we invested in called Pymetrics that uh, is actually having a pretty significant impact with the Fortune 100 companies they work with. What they've done is to build a recruiting platform that uses neuroscience games that give you trait analysis, cognitive traits, emotional traits, and match you against jobs that you would be successful in. Um, it's more sophisticated than I am making it sound, but, uh, but uh, Unilever, for example, um, got them to do this with 250,000 potential employees for the company and ended up with a vastly more diverse pool for them to hire from than they'd ever had before. And I say diverse. Uh, geographically, uh, background, racially, uh, every possible way you could look at that. Um, and uh, now a lot of other large companies are doing the same thing because it, it comes back to this issue of what pool you are, you are looking at. And if you don't have that, uh, you are you're always going to have a really hard time uh, making those hires. It's what you were talking about before. Uh, uh, and there's no way that, that a human being who goes out to solve that problem for a company is going to be able to do it. Because you're not going to be able to get to the 35 universities in you know, vastly distant places that might have one or two candidates who are perfect for this. Uh, so I think some of this is going to be solved by technology. By, by making sure that, that there are companies being backed that are also focused on this. Yeah, uh, I would just add that, um, like I think a secondary secret weapon for a lot of the companies we talk to is once they break out of their networks and tap into some vein of talent, whether it's from you know, outside of the, you know, God forbid, Ivy League schools or um, uh, even outside of traditional or urban centers, uh, they all of a sudden have this secret weapon it's like, oh my gosh, there are these unbelievable people in Ottawa who are coming from all over. And so it's, you know, obviously gender um, and uh, racial diversity is, is, I think, the most striking and obvious problem that we face. But uh, for a lot of these companies, just thinking of diversity of networks and diversity of backgrounds um, is, uh, it, it's not enough just to sort of check the, the cosmetic boxes. Yeah, and I think the good news is I think a lot of companies are including it in the, the metrics that we were talking about. The metrics are not usually just singly um, male, female. They're, they're broader than that, which is a good first step. Other questions? There's a bunch. I'll let the man with the mic choose. Hi. So um, for all the reasons you guys mentioned, right, 
diverse teams make better decisions, expand their networks, et cetera. Um, and Susan, you touched on this a little bit. I'm curious as to how you guys think about diverse sort of founding teams and how you evaluate companies to kind of create those sort of aspirational startups to get people in the ring. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, um, about 40% of our, um, our founding teams are gender diverse. Um, the other 60% are all female. Um, in some cases, a lone founder, although more frequently two women who founded a company together. Um, and I can't tell you that we are trying to change that. Um, we do look for, uh, for companies where we think the founders have, um, uh, have complementary skill sets. I think that's always crucially important. But, uh, but I don't believe you can mandate um, or rule out uh, a founding team that is not diverse. Those are likely the people who are going to get together and actually hammer out a great idea. Uh, I think the, the, um, the real diversity work comes later. I have a question for you. You were the only two that raised your hand when he asked about the board, all your company's board members at least had one female. Where, where do you work? <laughs> Awesome. Very cool. Awesome. I think Brad deserves to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we heard a little bit about um, sexual harassment poli policies and the things that were changing. Are your partnerships also talking about your potential co-investors and what they're doing and how they're behaving in the market? I don't know of any other firm that's changed their policy yet. So I think it would be a very small group so far of what they're doing. But um, I guess the blunt answer is, is no, we haven't had that discussion yet. It's a good question. Yeah, no. we haven't. <laughs> yeah, everyone, I'm unfortunately, so not good answers up here. And we really haven't good, that's a really good point. Either, so. It's a really good point. But it's a great point, especially if you're the lone voice on a board. Um, that's advocating for, you know, more explicit addressing diversity. It's, it can be a challenge. And th there have been moments where I think all of us have probably seen eyes roll slightly on boards, and that's not a good thing. You don't want to co-invest with people who aren't going to be aligned there. What we have done, I guess, is just highlight the risk of these, you know, seemingly small issues and how they can become very big issues <laughs> very quickly. So individually, hopefully that means, you know, our partners are thinking carefully about how, you know, who they're doing business with, and I can't guarantee they are, but, you know, hopefully we all are thinking about that. So I'm wondering where the LPs sit in this equation, and to what extent any of you guys are, are feeling like you're starting to be held accountable by your investors. I'm struck by the fact that Ben and I are just finishing up a fundraising process where we've talked to dozens and dozens of existing and prospective LPs and we're not asked a question along these lines even once. Um, now we have a relatively diverse team in the grand scheme of things and maybe people were just saying, okay, you guys are, have it figured out, although we don't actually have any women on our investment team yet. We're working on that. Um, so are you starting to hear that? From, from your LPs? The meetings that I've been in uh, when we were doing our fundraise about a year ago-ish, no, I never heard it once. Yeah, it's surprising. I mean, the only thing uh, I would say is that we've, um, we've had outreach from family offices who say they have a new generation coming in who uh, is much more focused on on diversity and want to invest in female founders or want to invest in female funds. Um, so I, I would imagine they're being pretty targeted about those kind of calls. 
uh, I'll just add, even though I'm not officially on the panel, um, we do get these questions and from our top LPs. And as recently, not even in fundraising, just in update discussions where they are aware of the senior hires we are contemplating making, and they are asking explicitly whether we are screening for female candidates. Uh, we're trying harder than we might otherwise to fill that with a minority or female candidate. And I would say occasionally probably all of us get background reference calls on other investors at other firms. And uh, this topic has started to be part of all those conversations just routinely. A uh, couple questions in the back. So uh, I'd like to ask the panel for their advice on a project uh, I've been asked to help out with. It's a gender parity score. Um, using publicly available data, it's pretty easy to assign a gender parity score to all private companies looking at leadership and the boards. Um, how would you go about disclosing this gender parity score on all private companies, giving the companies a chance to take a survey to make it more accurate, uh, and, and, and do it in a way that it, it was fair and produced the kind of positive outcomes we'd all like to see and didn't have adverse outcomes. The idea being if all companies had a FICO score that was a FICO-like score that showed their gender parity, it would wake people up to uh, how they might improve that score, how it might help them sell more, recruit more. Well, you could, you could find other places that people are going to check out private companies, employees looking to work there, Glassdoor, et cetera, and try to incorporate it there. You could try to incorporate it into PitchBook. I think you can build apps in PitchBook now. So you could try to incorporate it there, LinkedIn. Or you could just publish it on Medium, and it would get a lot of attention. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think you have to worry about whether people are going to find it. Um, the, uh, I, I think it's a great idea, if, if you recall, um, the way that, that public companies started reporting uh, their ratios, gender ratios, was because the woman who was running product at Pinterest sent around um, uh, a piece of paper to a bunch of people and said to her friends at other companies and said, go around and count the number of women engineers there are, right? And, and so just getting a spreadsheet that, that got a dozen companies to either um, edit those numbers and say, actually, you're off by 20, uh, but the fact that it was out there in public got people to really start thinking about it. And it's like everything else. What you count, what you measure, um, is what becomes important. I, I would add, I think it's potentially dangerous if the information isn't super granular um, because someone could have a great score and actually be a really toxic culture and you just don't actually know. But one route that might work uh, many of the venture investors in the room, I'm sure, participate in the salary survey across our portfolio companies that we all use to kind of calibrate salaries across executives. And it seems like a process like that where you get the venture firms to participate along with their venture portfolio companies to fill in the data and simply tabulate how many women versus men they have in functional areas would create a data set that would be interesting to see across industry, across sector, across geography. Great, one more in front here we may have a minute for. Thank you. Um, speaking of uh, earlier, uh, kind of more junior roles in venture firms, do you see also right now that there's actually greater demand for some of these um, qualified female candidates. Um, there was one fund I spoke with. Uh, they were going to hire a principal. She was hired by another firm as a partner. Um, and they also, I heard this uh, kind of um, sentiment that they are worried that uh, the women will, be, will not be staying as long because they're getting there's interest for them. So just wondering if you are seeing that situation at all. Uh, 
Any thoughts? Not significant data yet, but certainly, I mean, if you just take the, again, look at the funnel, and if, if there were zero metrics before with women in the funnel, and now suddenly even 30 or 40 percent, then certainly demand has gone up. We, we have had the situation happen that you described, where a senior hire on the investment staff got pulled away. We, we didn't hire them yet, but got pulled away at an even higher level at another firm. And I think it's because, fortunately, most of us in the industry are talking about this issue and trying to do something about it. And I think all the firms represented here, some are further ahead than others, uh, and all the folks in the room, for the most part, are trying hard to find terrific investors who happen to be women, um, because that will, that will be the number one thing that we can do to address this, this inequity. Um, the, the other, maybe, I don't know if we have time for any more, but one, one other topic I'll just throw out there, and maybe we'll talk about it in five years, if I get asked back in five, maybe 10 years. But I think we'll probably, I hope and suspect, not be discussing issues of gender diversity or racial diversity in the coastal communities where venture exists in five years. But I do think we'll be talking about socioeconomic diversity and geographic diversity in incredibly painful ways as the have and have not sectors of our country get so polarized geographically. And that seems like ultimately a harder one to solve because as companies get formed where venture people exist on the coast uh, and other parts of the country don't have those economic opportunities, what do we do? Do we tell our companies to start putting offices in, in other parts of the country? Do we start opening, you know, putting partners down there? I think that's going to be a tough one. Yeah, I, I, I think about that a little bit, and you know, you brought up uh, Stitch Fix earlier, uh, and I, I remember when Stitch Fix came out, I thought, oh, what a genius idea, and I think Trunk Club, like an interesting business, had been sitting there for three or four years, you know, tapping into 20% of the fashion spend when this idea was just sitting there for anyone to take, and I can only imagine that we are highly biased by our, you know, our New York, San Francisco, I'm in Boston, and I consider that like a little provincial or whatever, but um, uh, bias towards um, you know upper quartile income, especially in the consumer world, uh, and we're missing massive business opportunities that are you know serving more geographic and socioeconomic diversity. All right, thanks, folks. Thanks, panelists. Thank you very much. Well done.